The title of my little talk is called Old and New Christian Zionisms. Most Jews and Christians are familiar with only one kind of Christian Zionism, that which is evangelical and dispensationalist. Now, that last word is uh, uh, a complicated one, and, and let me uh, sum it up with three characteristics of dispensationalism. That's a conservative uh, um, Christian view of the history of the church and the history of Israel that says, number one, that, uh, that a traditional dispensationalism says, and I have to make a distinction between traditional and, and, and a newer version of that called progressive dispensationalism that emerged in the last 20 years. But traditional dispensationalism, which started in the mid 19th century over in England and, and came to the United States in, in the 20th century, um, you could sum up with four characteristics. Number one, that, uh, that Israel and the Christian church are on two different tracks in history. God is guiding each. And the tracks are parallel that do not intersect. Number two, uh, traditional dispensationalism has an elaborate, uh, a series of elaborate eschatologies that have been spun out about the end times, what's going to happen and when, with usually particular schedules. This will happen first, and then that will happen second, and something else a third time. And sometimes even date setting. And number three, uh, dispensationalists are known for their belief in the doctrine of the rapture, which is basically where they believe that God will take true believers out of the world, literally, before the end of the world. And then fourth, a dispensationalist, and they have been very supportive of, of the emergence of the modern state of Israel, uh, and they believe it's a fulfillment of of, of uh, um, predominantly uh, Old Testament, Tanakh prophecies, um, they are often, or at least sometimes, not willing to criticize the state of Israel. So this is the kind of Christian Zionism that most Christians and most Jews are familiar with, and, and whenever they hear the term Christian Zionism, that's what they think of. Dispensational, the, the dispensationalist variety. Uh, and academics have uh, typically, for the last 40, 50 years, have treated it with contempt. Uh, but there's a new Christian Zionism led by, by not just conservative evangelical Protestants, but by Catholics and mainline Protestants and also some evangelicals and many Anglicans. And, there, and this new Christian Zionism has really nothing to do with dispensationalism. Most of your new Christian Zionist thinkers today uh, reject dispensationalism, but uh, not all. Um, so new Christian Zionists today are committed to the idea that the Jewish state is necessary to protect the covenanted people of Israel. Now this involves two things. Uh, number one, that the Jewish people in the New Testament, the majority of whom rejected Jesus as Messiah, that this part of the Jewish people is still in God's covenant. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 11:28, as regards election, now, now this is Romans. This is the closest thing we have to Paul's systematic theology. It's written toward the end of his career. Probably, scholars estimate about 58. He's probably executed by Nero about 62. And it's almost 30 years after his conversion to Jesus as Messiah. And here he's saying, at the end of almost 30 years, as regards election, now that's a word that we forget really means chosenness. The Jews is the chosen people. 
as regards chosenness, they, now the they here, are his Jewish brothers and sisters who have not accepted Jesus as Messiah. He says they are, present tense, not were, but are, present tense, beloved for the sake of their forefathers. So non-Messianic Jews are still beloved by God in God's covenant. God has not broken his covenant. God has not transferred his covenant with Israel to a Gentile church. And, and the second thing about the Jewish state being necessary for the new Christian Zionism is, is, is the new Christian Zionists recognize that any people needs a state to protect them, especially Jews, as we've learned in the last century. Now, new Christian Zionists also believe that the return of Jews to the land of Israel in great number in the last two centuries is a fulfillment of biblical prophecies. Not just prophecies from what Christians call the Old Testament, Jews call Tanakh. I mean, all your anti-Christian Zionists uh, concede that the Old Testament predicts a great return of Jews from the diaspora. What's different now is that we say this is in the New Testament. It's not just the Old Testament, it's not just Tanakh, it's in the New Testament. This prophecy of a massive ingathering of Jews from the diaspora all over the world that, that will happen in the end times. So Peter, in Acts 3.21, is giving his second speech in Jerusalem. And Peter, the Apostle Peter, talks about a restoration that is still to come, that has not happened yet. And the word he uses is apokatastasis. And apokatastasis is the word that's used over and over again in, in, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of Tanakh, that was the principal Bible used by the early church. And he says this, and it's used all over um, the Septuagint for a future return of Jews from the diaspora all over the world back to the land of Israel. So Peter says, this is yet to come. Um, Jesus says in Acts 1-6, or, or he's asked by his disciples in Acts 1, said, in, in Acts 1 um, 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 Jesus, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now Jesus says, the Father has set the time for that, and it's not for you to know now. So notice the implication of, of, of these two verses, Acts 3.21 and Acts 1.6. The death and resurrection of Jesus, which are in the past, according to this story, is not the last event for Israel. Something more is to come. Then in Luke 13, Jesus himself says, one day in the future, Jerusalem's going to welcome me. In Matthew 19, Jesus says, at the renewal of all things, this future restoration, the Jewish apostles will rule over the 12 Jewish tribes of the land of Israel. That's Matthew 19, 28. In Luke 21, um, Jesus says, Jerusalem someday, someday in the future, will keep on being trampled upon by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So sometime in the future, now, when Jesus said this, uh, the streets of Jerusalem were, were being trampled on by the Gentiles, the Romans. So he's saying sometime in the future that's going to change. And the Gentiles are no longer going to be in control, are no longer um, going to be sovereign over Jerusalem. Now, do we new Christian Zionists say this is a prediction of the present state of Israel? No. No. But we think that these passages, and, and this is just a sampling of passages in the New Testament, clearly indicate that the New Testament writers believed that Gentiles would not always have sovereignty over the land, and the Jews would one day have sovereignty over the land. And that the recent ingathering, 
massive ingathering of Jews from all over the world in the last 150 years, and the even more recent control of Jerusalem and the land by Jews since 1967 are significant, are theologically significant. The return and the no more trampling down of Jerusalem by the Gentiles and are what the Bible might call the first fruits of later, greater events. Now the Bible often depicts the fulfillment, the, the fulfillment of prophecies in stages, little fulfillments that point to later and greater fulfillments. And we think that these are some of them. Now, so we don't believe that this particular Jewish state today under Netanyahu is, is you know, necessarily the last Jewish state. We, we do not believe it's a perfect state. We believe there are problems. We believe it's worthy of criticism. Uh, I am amazed when I go to Israel to see how critical Israelis are of their own state. But we do believe that these early, and perhaps you could say lesser fulfillments, are, are significant because for much of Christian history, at least since the fourth century, Christians have thought that the New Testament has no concern for the land of Israel and that once Jesus rose from the dead, that God no longer was in covenant with non-Messianic Jews who don't believe in Jesus as Messiah. But, but this new movement called the New Christian Zionism says that God's covenant with Jewish Israel is still in place. Paul says they are beloved, they are chosen. And, and, that the New Testament, the, and, and that the New Testament authors believe the land of Israel will be theologically significant in the future. If you look at the book of Revelation, the last book in the New Testament, you know, it's all about you know, future end times. It's full of references to the Jewish people. It's full of references to the land of Israel. Now, we also argue that, Christians, that this kind of Christian Zionism was alive and well in the first three centuries of Christianity and then was renewed in the 16th century, long before the 19th century rise of premillennial dispensationalism that is typically uh, thought of as, as the only Christian Zionism that exists. So you go back to Justin Martyr, uh, was martyred in 165 in mid second century. He says a millennium is going to come, a thousand year rule of Christ through the saints, and it's going to be centered in Jerusalem. You look at Irenaeus, the church father who dies in 202, the beginning of the third century. He, he, uh, he says someday in the future the earth will be renewed just as our bodies will be renewed at the general resurrection so too the earth is going to be renewed and this is what the Bible means by the new heavens and the new earth and Israel will be the center of the earth's renewal. You, you go to Tertullian who is early third century. One day he says Jews will return to the land. But then in the Middle Ages this this early Christian Zionism, uh, and particularly after Augustine, uh, at the end of the fourth beginning of the fifth century, and, and after Constantine's um, uh, conquest of the empire in the fourth century, this largely goes underground in the Middle Ages, uh, except for people like Joachim of Fiori. But then it comes up once again above the ground uh, in the Puritans, not 18th century, not 17th century, but 16th century, right at the beginning of the Reformation in the Puritans, uh, you've got the Geneva Bible, which Sam has written about in his wonderful book, best book ever written on Christian Zionism, in my opinion. Uh, the Geneva Bible, 1560, so right in the middle of the 16th century, in its notes, it, it, uh, the editors say, God's covenant with the Jewish people is perpetual it did not end after the resurrection of Jesus, and it includes a title to the land. Judea, quote, shall be restored, close quote, and Jerusalem will be rebuilt. In the 17th century, the Puritans continued it. Jews will return to the land, they said, without being converted to Jesus. 
Now, Thomas Drax wrote that Israel is still God's chosen nation, that Christians are debtors to Jews, that the return of the Jews sometime in the future will cause the Turks to try to exterminate them. Thomas Brightman writes in 1611, there is nothing more sure than the return of Jews to Jerusalem. Uh, Member of, Parla of Parliament Henry Finch writes in 1621, everything that's written about Israel in the Old Testament is about the Jews, not Christians. Now this is noteworthy because Calvin and most of the Calvinist tradition, also called the Reformed tradition, says that all the prophecies about the future of Israel are really about the future of the Gentile church. Now, the Puritans are Calvinists, but they depart from Calvin on this. And they take the Reformation emphasis on a plain sense reading of the Bible, and they apply it here to everything they find in the Old Testament about Israel. And they say, okay, some things uh, perhaps are types, and the anti-type is the Gentile church, but many other passages are clearly about Jewish Israel and should not be hyper-spiritualized, should not be interpreted in a spiritual manner to refer to the Gentile church. Uh, John Milton, in Paradise Regained, 1670, says the Jews will return to the land. He was convinced. John Cotton, you might remember that name, uh, one, one of the elders in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, said the Gentiles should help the Jews return to the land by giving them chariots and horses and camels. Uh, Increase Mather, 1669, writes a book, a very influential book, The Mystery of Israel's Salvation. He writes in there that Israel will repossess its ancient land before converting to Jesus the Messiah. It's wrong to spiritualize the promises to Jews in the Old Testament and presume they are meant for Christians. Then in the 18th century, more Calvinists, Wilhelm Brockel, uh, a Dutch uh, um, theologian uh, releases a four-volume systematic theology in 1711. He says, the church is not the new Israel. And by the way, the New Testament never says the church is the new Israel. Not once. Eighty times the word Israel is in the New Testament. And, never, and every one of those 80 times, in, including Galatians 6.16, refers to the people or, 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 or the polity of Jewish Israel. Uh, and Brockle says the Jews will return to the land. Um, Jonathan Edwards, um, some of us think the greatest religious mind in North America, uh, not just then, but ever, um, says it's wrong to spiritual, now he's 18th century, and Edwards wrote that it's wrong to spiritualize the promises to the Jews and just apply them to the Gentile church. The Jews will return to the land because the prophecies about the return have only been partly fulfilled. Most Jews are still in the diaspora. He says it's necessary for God to make the return of Jews a visible monument of his grace and power. Canaan will once again be a spiritual center of the world, and Israel will be a distinct nation sometime in the future, he said. In the 1790s, just to illustrate how pervasive in England this belief in the future return of Jews to the land was, Cambridge University sponsored an essay contest. Uh, and the instructions were to write on the biblical grounds for expecting the future restoration of the Jews. Now, all of these writers in the 18th century are post-millennialists not premillennialists. I say that because typically scholars have assumed almost to a person that Christian Zionism is only about premillennial dispensationalists starting in the mid 19th century. These were all postmillennialists, and post means that they believe that Jesus will come after the millennium, not pre before the millennium. In, in the 19th century, you've got Lord Shaftesbury, Lord Ashley, a seventh Earl of Shaftesbury, leading proponent of Christian Zionism in the 19th century. His work laid the groundwork for the Balfour Declaration in 1917, which states the English government's goal of establishing a national home for the Jewish people. This led to the League of Nations, giving control over Jordan and Israel to Britain, and eventually led to the State of Israel in 1948. Now, Shaftesbury was inspired by three things. Number one, that the Jews 
have been the victims for centuries of Christian persecution. He, he was ashamed of his own country's persecution of Jews. You know, England was the first Western nation to ban Jews, and he knew that. And he says, now we English have a chance to be the first Gentile nation to stop the pattern of treading down Jerusalem, quoting Jesus in Luke 21. And, and he says, uh, notice this, that ever since we English started sheltering Jews under Cromwell and Charles, England has prospered. And so has Holland, which now has huge power despite its tiny size. Now he's writing back in the 19th century. Spain, which once was the greatest power in Europe, but is now declining everywhere and has been declining ever since Spain expelled its Jews. And Shaftesbury says, I think this is a perfect illustration of Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, Karl Barth was probably the most influential Christian theologian of the 20th century. Karl Barth was raised with dispensationalist influence. He, he rejected the dispensationalism, but he never rejected the principle of God's sovereignty over the world and, and over history. And he said 1948, the establishment of the state of Israel, was a secular parable. Now those are his words. A symbol of, of the resurrection and of the kingdom of God. He said the return of Jews to the land is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies such as Isaiah 2 when the Gentiles will come to Israel to learn Torah. He says the Old Testament speaks of a history of Jews that continues to our own day. And he says particularly Ezekiel's prophecy of the dry bones in, in chapter 37 speaks of Israel's restoration to the land. And he he observed that any nation, or, or he prophesied, that any nation that deliberately opposes Israel will not fare very well in the long run. So, in sum, um, uh, we in the New Christian Zionism believe that Christian Zionism is not recent, but is 2,000 years old, started in the New Testament. Uh, it's a retrieval of what's in the New Testament. Um, and there are many other important Christian Zionists who are not, um, who are quite important intellectuals. So, so the Catholic Gary Anderson, the great Old Testament scholar at Notre Dame, Robert Jensen, um, recently deceased, the great Lutheran theologian, was a Christian Zionist, and uh, none of them have anything to do with dispensationalism. 